é um prazer receber vocês aqui na FAPESP. Nosso convidado hoje é o Dr. Francis Collins, diretor do ENAEGE, que vai proferir a conferência Genomics, Advanced Technology and the Future of Medicine. Para compor essa mesa de abertura, eu convido o presidente da FAPESP, Dr. Celso Laffer. Nosso convidado, Dr. Francis Collins. Nosso vice-presidente, Dr. Krieger. E o diretor científico da FAPESP, Dr. Brito Cruz. Com a palavra, o Dr. Celso Laffer. Todas é um prazer recebê-los hoje, quando teremos o privilégio de ouvir o nosso conferencista, o professor Francis Collins. Para a FAPESP, que tem tido uma preocupação constante do, uh, de levar adiante os mecanismos de internacionalização e de intercâmbio, ter alguém da estatura profissional que dirige uma instituição como é na ED é uma oportunidade adicional de avançarmos nessa linha. E sem maiores considerações, é, vou dar sequência a esta cerimônia de abertura. Well, thank you very much. It's really wonderful to be able to be here at FAPESP this morning and I will be giving a presentation about some scientific musings about the remarkable period we find ourselves in in terms of biomedical research. And I'm particularly glad to be here in Brazil because Brazil is our most important partner in South America uh, for NIH. And FAPESP is a very important part of the reason for saying that. And I will even in my talk, if you hang around and listen, be able to announce uh, a new project that was just agreed upon finally yesterday and uh, will be announced this morning, which I think you'll find quite exciting. So thank you for being here, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be able to be in this remarkable institution with you this morning. Thank you. Professor Brito. Myself. Well, uh, welcome, everyone. I will just make a, a brief introduction about Dr. Collins, we are very happy and honored to have his, him visiting uh, FAPESP together with colleagues from NIH, also with uh, Dr. Roger Glass from the Fogarty Institute. Welcome to FAPESP. Uh, Dr. Dr. Collins is a physician geneticist noted for his landmark discoveries of disease genes and his leadership of the International Human Genome Project, which culminated in April 2003 with the completion of a finished sequence, sequence of the Human DNA Instruction Book. He served as director of the National Human Genome Research Institute at the NIH from 1993 to 2008. Before going to NIH, Dr. Colling was a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at the University of Michigan. He's an elected member of the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences. Was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in November 2007 and received the National Medal of Science in 2009. We are honored to have Dr. Dr. Collins here for this talk on uh, genomics, advanced technology, and the future of medicine. The floor is yours, Professor. Right. Thank you. Great. Okay, thank you. 
Well, it is a great privilege to be here this morning. Uh, already uh, acknowledged uh, in the introductions, but I want to acknowledge again Dr. Roger Glass, uh, who's here in the front row, who's the director of the Fogarty International Center, a fundamental part of what NIH is doing in global health, and who is uh, visiting Brazil with me, uh, along with Kevin Bialy, who's here also from Fogarty, who has been our point person uh, for research in Brazil and somebody who knows this country quite well, and a number of other visitors that I won't name because of time who are traveling with us uh, from HHS uh, and from the State Department. We're really excited to have a chance to learn a bit more about FAPESPI this morning, but I wanted to set the stage here with uh, some comments about areas of research that seem particularly ripe uh, for advancement right now. And what I'm learning about Brazil, the way in which resources are being invested in medical research right now, makes it a very exciting time uh, for your country. And I'm glad to see many students here. Uh, if you were coming into this uh, talk wondering about uh, whether there's a future for medical research, my answer is going to be a resounding yes. Uh, it's almost like the perfect time uh, to be getting into this field. So much promise, and in this country, so much strong support uh, for seeing science grow and develop. Uh, so you are on a path, I think, towards a very exciting career. The National Institutes of Health in the US is the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world. It has a dual mission, both to do fundamental basic science, as you see in this first part of our statement, but to make sure that that basic science then gets applied to the benefit of human health. About half of our resources go to basic science and about half go to applied, and that's been true for quite a long time. We support research across the country of the United States by giving out grants based on rigorous peer review uh, to institutions in all 50 states, but as you can see from the color coding, uh, those states that have very uh, intense uh, focus on research in their universities uh, tend to be the ones uh, where the largest number of grants are awarded. That sort of makes sense. And we also fund research across the world. Every country that is in green here uh, includes at least uh, one, and most of them many, uh, collaborative ventures uh, where research is going on uh, in those parts of the world. And of course, that includes Brazil. Again, Brazil is our most significant South American partner with many important efforts underway, and I'll touch on just a few of them by example in the course of this presentation, although if I tried to be complete about that, we would be here for a very long time. We have lots of really interesting science that we're doing together, and I think more to come. I thought I would try to break down my presentation about major opportunities in medical research around five themes. And they're actually the five themes that I identified five years ago when I agreed to take on the role of being the NIH director. The first of those is really the basic science effort, much of it dependent upon exciting uh, high throughput technologies that allow us to ask questions about how life works and how disease occurs. But again, most of the work that goes on in basic science is and will continue to be done by individual investigators uh, with their creative ideas, but increasingly undergirded and supported uh, by some of these large-scale projects with all the data being made immediately publicly accessible, the Genome Project being a particularly uh, visible example. But we do, as a second theme, want to translate those discoveries into better treatments as quickly as we can, and there are lots of bottlenecks and obstacles there that we're wrestling with, and I'll say something about those. Even for things that have reached the point of being practiced out there in the general practice of medicine, we're not always sure whether we're doing the right thing. So are there opportunities uh, to do research to identify uh, what works and what doesn't work in the real world as far as interventions? And I'll say something about that in a project that we have that involves Brazil and several other countries and the U.S. looking at heart disease. And the fourth of my five themes when I came to this job five years ago, and maybe the one that surprised some of my colleagues, was a specific focus on global health because we are all part of one community these days and we have a lot to offer each other and diseases don't particularly pay attention to country boundaries and the more that we can work together, the better off our whole world will be. The fifth theme is the one that perhaps is particularly near and dear to my heart because none of these things are going to happen unless we make sure that we are nurturing and encouraging 
the talent and the creativity uh, of the biomedical research community. That's our most critical resource. Looking around this room, that's a lot of you uh, we are depending on, uh, and we want to be sure that we're uh, supporting that resource in a way that nurtures and creates an environment uh, for risk-taking, uh, for asking really hard questions and trying to get answers. So I'm going to go through those themes briefly, and I hope at the end we'll have time for some questions that might be on your mind. Starting with the basic science one. Well, it probably won't surprise you that I'm going to say something about the Human Genome Project, since it was, after all, my job to oversee this international effort, uh, which was really quite scary at the beginning because we'd made a promise we were going to read out all three billion letters of the human genome by 2000 and five, and there was no real idea about how to do that. Uh, but fortunately, by the recruitment of some of the best and brightest scientists uh, that I could identify and the involvement of no less than six countries and ultimately about 2,400 scientists, uh, we achieved all the goals of the Human Genome Project, not in 2005, but in 2003, uh, two years ahead of schedule. For the people in the U.S. Congress, I was particularly happy to be also able to say that we spent $400 million less than we had planned to. And they, don't often hear that, so that won a bit of credibility. The project, of course, had many components. And uh, in this uh, cartoon that lays out what happened over those uh, 13 years uh, are many of the specific milestones that were achieved in publications. And it wasn't just about sequencing human DNA. It also involved model organisms, a lot of technology development. Uh, but it was a wild ride uh, and a wonderful outcome. And one of the signal uh, uh, achievements, I think, of the Human Genome Project was the decision to make all the data immediately accessible, putting it into the public domain every 24 hours, uh, not allowing time for patents to be filed, uh, and not doing anything that would obstruct the opportunity for people who had a good idea about what to do with this information uh, to get started. And that has really created an ethic I think for much of what NIH is doing as far as this kind of a project, that you make the data available as soon as you possibly can, as soon as you're sure it's right. Now we get to the clinical part of this, and uh, this cartoon kind of portrays the problem that we are now facing over the last 10 years, trying to figure out how to take those 3 billion A, C's, G's, and T's and make sense out of them in a way that would provide medical benefit. I'm a physician. I was always excited about genomics because of the promise it has uh, for medicine, but it's not trivial uh, to take uh, this basic information written in a language that we barely understand and see how that applies uh, to various uh, medical problems for which we desperately need answers. So of course that reference human sequence was nice to have, but it was sort of a generic sequence actually derived from about six individuals whose identity remains unknown, and that was intended. Uh, we needed to understand the variability between humans as well. And for that purpose, uh, the HapMap project, also international, uh, was established to look at the 0.1% of the human genome that differs between individuals and try to build a catalog of that. An even more extensive catalog, recently developed by the Thousand Genomes Project, which has actually sequenced now about 2,500 genomes. So you really get a sense of what variation looks like across the world. But that just tells you, again, about DNA sequence. You want to know how it works. And another project uh, which has been fascinating uh, to see develop, also involving multiple investigators in several countries, the focus on trying to understand what are the function of those DNA elements. So ENCODE is an acronym standing for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, trying to identify not just the 1.5 percent of the genome that codes for protein, but what's going on in the rest of it that involves those regulatory signals that tell a gene whether to be on or off in a given situation. And a lot of really interesting science has come out of that kind of effort involving the field of epigenomics, uh, where you're identifying what proteins actually bind to DNA and how do they affect whether RNA is being transcribed or not off of a particular gene. So all of those data sets, also being immediately available for scientists to work on, are beginning to fill in a lot of the gaps in our knowledge about this very complicated question of genome function. But we obviously have uh, many, many uh, important questions that still remain unanswered. One of the consequences, though, of the information we have already is the ability to begin to identify what are the hereditary risk factors for common diseases, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, schizophrenia, 
autism, Alzheimer's, all of these disorders which we know tend to run in families but don't follow a simple inheritance pattern. They're not dominant, they're not recessive, they're polygenic. And until about five or six years ago, we had very limited tools to be able to map precisely what were those genetic risk factors that we knew must be out there. The strategy that became possible after HapMap is actually a rather straightforward one. If you're looking to find of the roughly 10 million variants in the human genome that are relatively common across the world, which of those actually confer risk of a disease for, say, diabetes, you basically can do a case control study. Uh, you have affected individuals, you have unaffected individuals, and you test variant after variant until you find something like variant B, where there's a real skewing in the odds of who has which particular spelling at that locus. Now, looking at this cartoon, you will immediately say, whoa, you've got to be careful here about false positives, because uh, if you're actually looking at 10 million variants, you're going to find a lot of them that look skewed. So you have to have some rigorous mathematics here to decide when you've found something you can believe. And it also means you need lots and lots of cases and controls. And many of these so-called genome-wide association studies uh, have expanded uh, to study tens of thousands, or in a couple of cases, even hundreds of thousands of cases and controls in order to boost the statistical power. But the results have been breathtaking. Again, five or six years ago, for common diseases, uh, you could write down on a half a page uh, the contributions that we knew about uh, to genetic risk factors. Now here's what we can write down, except you have to print it out because you couldn't possibly write it down. Each one of those colored circles here mapped onto the human chromosomes to show you where they're located in the genome represents a variant that's associated with an increased risk of a common disease. And the colors represent different diseases, and I'm not showing you the code because it would be too complicated to walk through, but uh, this is more than a thousand. Each one of these has a statistical likelihood of being associated with disease uh, better than a p-value of 5 times 10 to the minus 8, uh, which is the threshold you really need to stick to if you're going to be sure you're not making false positive calls. My own research lab works on type 2 diabetes. Uh, we've been deeply engaged in this effort, uh, studying uh, diabetics and controls in Finland, and my freezer now has about 35,000 DNA samples in in it derived from those individuals who also have very extensive phenotype characterization. But even that wasn't enough to really do what you want to. So we joined up with other uh, type 2 diabetes researchers, and the most recent study involves about 200,000 uh, samples, about two-thirds cases and one-third controls, and has revealed no less than 82 genetic variants that are highly statistically likely to be associated with diabetes. Of those 82, only about 10 percent of them are in the coding region. That is, they alter an amino acid. The rest of them are regulatory, telling you that that's going to be a pretty important place to understand in the genome. And that is the theme for most of these, in fact. For whatever disease you're looking at uh, by this strategy, most of the variation is not in the coding region. It's regulatory. But that's pretty exciting. Now, why does this help us? These, these variants, by the way, have a modest effect on risk. They haven't turned out to be particularly powerful for offering people preventive information uh, that they might want to adjust their own uh, pattern of wellness, although a few of us have done so, myself included. Uh, the information is relatively squishy. Uh, it's statistical risk factors that might increase or decrease for a particular disease, your chance of getting it. But it's certainly not as much as we'd like to have in terms of fully understanding heritability. But what this does tell you is what the pathways are that must be involved in these diseases. And most of what we've learned are surprises. They are not the pathways we already knew about. I hope you get the sense here about why this is revolutionary, because this strategy allows you not to limit your search for the truth to things that you could already sort of guess at. This is a comprehensive look at the entire genome, which is a bounded set of information. It's not going to get any bigger, I'm glad to say. But it is possible with this kind of approach to be able to identify the pathways involved in a disease like diabetes uh, without any preconceived notion of what the answer is going to be. And it does point us uh, to actionable findings 
that are already enlivening uh, the idea about new therapeutics uh, for this disease and many others as well. So it's a window into therapeutics. By the way, it's interesting for diabetes. If you take the drugs that we already know about that work in this disease, and those drugs, for the most part, we understand their mechanism. We know what pathway they interact with. Well, they all turn up in this search. The positive controls, you might say, are there, which tells you it's probably not a bad strategy to find the next generation of drugs that we didn't know about, because the strategy seems to be capable of finding those for the ones we do know. Anyway, that has been a very exciting step forward. This is, however, about common diseases. What about those diseases that are more strongly genetic, uh, recessives or dom dominants, that are mostly uh, inherited in a more Mendelian way and are mostly quite rare? Well, to go after those, uh, one needed actually the ability to sequence a genome, uh, not just to sample the variable parts. And for that, the cost of sequencing was daunting for a long time, but look and see what's happened to that over the course of the last 13 years. Sequencing a genome in 2001 would have cost you about $100 million. Uh, it's now down to less than 10,000, and by the end of this year, it's projected to reach the mythical $1,000 genome, which we had projected we'd ultimately get to, but maybe not this soon. And the equipment for doing this has also shrunk in size from big bulky instruments like that uh, to some of them that are as small as a postage stamp, like the one I'm holding up here. That's a sequencing machine, all micro-scaled uh, to the point where you can do this. Uh, really quite qu conveniently and quickly. And we're not done with the technology advances in this field. People are now looking at things like nanopores uh, that might mac microscale this even further and drop the cost even further. So whatever project people are working on in human biology, genomics has emerged as a tool uh, to tackle it in a way that previously wouldn't have been thinkable. Most of us have been depending on nucleic acid hybridization <laughs> to be able to look at RNA, for instance. Increasingly now, instead of looking at microarrays uh, to do RNA analysis, people are saying, let's just do sequencing. Convert the, R R the RNA to cDNA and sequence it. Uh, it's, it Maybe it gives you more digital information, tells you about alternative splicing, and it's increasingly cost effective. So big revolution here because of genomics. One of the applications uh, of genomics that is particularly powerful is to cancer, because cancer is a disease of DNA. And the ability to take any individual tumor and run through its sequence and identify what are the mutations uh, that are creating that malignant phenotype uh, has gone from a hypothetical to a reality. Now, it's not trivial. In any given tumor, you're going to find lots of mutations. Most of them are not causative. They're the noise in the system. They're what we call passengers. But somewhere in there are the drivers that are actually activating an oncogene or inactivating a tumor suppressor gene that are really important to understand. In order to tell the difference between drivers and passengers, generally you need a lot of tumors so you can start to see the same gene emerging more than once in your data set. The Cancer Genome Atlas uh, started five years ago uh, by the Genome Institute when I was its director. And the Cancer Institute decided to try to tackle this uh, by taking on uh, the, the difficult task of identifying and collecting lots of tumor samples. And you also want blood samples from the same individual, because you want to be able to tell what was a hereditary mutation and what was a somatic mutation. And by now, uh, TCA, TCGA uh, has provided analysis of quite a number of cancer types and published them. But this evolved uh, nicely into an understanding about cancer that is really quite profound. When you start to look at larger and larger data sets, uh, at the time of this publication last fall, they could catalog 127 genes that pop up more than you would expect by chance uh, that are shared by subsets of samples, but across cancer types. So what this is telling us is that we probably want to move away from a diagnosis of cancer that is focused on the organ in which the cancer arose into a diagnosis that reflects what mutations are present in that cancer that's driving the malignancy. Maybe a lot less relevant whether this is a prostate cancer or a lung cancer than what particular mutations are driving it. This has also, I'm happy to say, uh, become 
a opportunity for international collaboration in the International Cancer Genome Consortium, uh, which came into being now three or four years ago, has brought together many countries involved in this effort, um, oftentimes focused on malignancies that are a particularly strong public health problem in their part of the world. Uh, again, with a dedication to making all the data available as soon as it's been derived, and I'm happy to point out that Brazil is part of this ICGC. Uh, Brazil's particular focus at the moment is on melanoma, that most uh, dangerous form of skin cancer, uh, and it's wonderful to have that collaboration as part of what you can see here, really quite an amazing uh, international network. All of this also brings up a challenge that we are facing increasingly and I bring it up here in the context of cancer genomics, but I could have br brought it up in multiple other ways as well. These kinds of technologies are making it possible uh, for us uh, to generate huge databases, databases that can be made public and which you want uh, people to have access to and to be able to compute all sorts of interesting findings, sort of deriving the nuggets of really important biological insight and yet, if the data is all in a scrambled format, if it's all uh, balkanized in various uh, servers where you can't readily get access to, uh, if the data about genomics is not connected with other types of data, uh, you're not going to be able to see that happen. And there are lots of data types here. There's genomics, sure. There's other omic types of data, proteomics. Uh, next week in Nature, you will see a very interesting paper about proteomics. Imaging data. Uh, phenotype data, exposure data, clinical data, increasingly uh, electronic medical records. So we, I think, as a field of biomedical research, have arrived uh, at a space that was formerly occupied mostly by high-energy physicists, uh, cosmologists, uh, people who worried about weather satellites who had very large data sets to deal with. Well, we have now reached respectability and the number of terabytes uh, that we are producing and that we need to keep track of. And I think one of my messages whenever I talk uh, to a group of researchers is we need to take this on squarely uh, and we need to be sure that all of the future scientists that we're training uh, develop the skills in computational strategies uh, for projects that are going to be necessary to be competitive because so much of what we are going to be doing in the future will depend upon that. And we need to be sure as an international community that we're developing the kinds of access databases that make it possible uh, for people to be able to find these data sets. And we at NIH are in the midst of ramping up uh, a new program called Big Data to Knowledge, uh, which will include the generation of a data commons where all this information can go and people can find it. Uh, again, I think this is an area to watch closely in the next few years uh, to be sure that we don't miss the opportunity uh, to get this part right. Well, coming back to those disorders with known molecular basis, many of which are rare genetic diseases, look and see what's happened because of the availability of genomic technologies. We now know the molecular cause of more than 5,000 of those diseases, most of them, again, relatively uncommon. In some instances, very uncommon, and yet now with DNA sequencing, uh, we are able, maybe even with a couple of patients, uh, to be able to find the cause. Uh, perhaps I'll give you an example in a minute. One of the programs that we have at NIH, which has gotten some attention, uh, including by uh, 60 Minutes, is a program to invite individuals who have been afflicted with some mysterious illness and who have been analyzed and examined by multiple physicians in multiple medical centers without achieving a diagnosis, to come to NIH to our clinical center, which is a 240-bed research hospital. The only patients there are on research protocols. And they go through a week-long evaluation uh, by a team of experts, about 30 physicians. And they um, try to figure out what's going on, and that includes uh, diag uh, diagnosis based on genomic analysis. Uh, so these patients generally get a either full genome sequence or at least a sequence of the exome, the coding part of the genome. And it's been interesting. About a quarter of the time, we do get at a very specific diagnosis. There's still lots of frustrations. We've already, I think, defined about 20 new diseases as a consequence of this. Uh, and this is a real opportunity, maybe something to think about in other parts of the world as well, since the technology is making it possible. I'll give you one uh, example. Uh, here's a disease that was causing fevers and rashes and strokes 
in three young patients uh, seen at our clinical center. Unrelated patients happened to come along in the space of a couple of years. The physicians seeing them recognized the similarity but didn't know what this was. So uh, the thought was perhaps uh, with the fever and the rash that the strokes were happening because of inflammation. That turns out to be right. But no idea what the mechanism would be. Again, these are children. You might very strongly then suspect a recessive genetic disease, but you didn't know. So investigation was done, and exome, that is the coding region of the genome, was sequenced. And for all three of these kids, it turned out that they had both copies of a gene called ADA2, about which not much was known until then, that were mutated. So they were not actually producing this protein. That turns out to be an enzyme that's key for blood vessel development and also for immune cell balance. And so a deficiency of ADA2 caused by these mutations uh, explained why they were having the features, immune abnormalities, inflammation. Uh, the disease got a new name, DADA2. And uh, for patients with that condition, two of whom you see here came to visit me in my office, are in fact now in a circumstance where already they're enrolled in a clinical trial to see whether plasmapheresis, since ADA2 is a circulating protein, might actually provide the benefit that they need. And obviously, you can imagine downstream some sort of enzyme therapy uh, for this disorder. So maybe we also, in this circumstance, learn something about stroke in general. That's often been the case. You study a rare disease, you learn about the rare disease, but you all get, also get insight into a common disease. As long as I'm talking about basic science initiatives in my first theme, and don't worry, the other four aren't going to go on quite as long as this one. This is an area, though, that I thought would be of particular interest to this group. The Brain Initiative in the U.S., announced just a year ago by the President, uh, is another bold opportunity to bring together disciplines uh, that generally haven't worked that closely together, engineers as well as electrophysiologists, imaging experts, neuroscientists, uh, uh, neurologists, and see what could we do together, a lot of computation in here too, uh, to understand how the brain works. That's a pretty big challenge. You have 86 billion neurons, plus or minus, depending on who you're talking about, uh, <laughs> in between your ears. And we can study neurons one at a time, and we know something about what they do individually. And you can take images of the brain increasingly even real-time images using things like fMRI uh, and figure out something about what the brain is doing on the larger scale. But there's a whole vast area in between those levels of resolution that we understand very poorly. I mean, how do circuits work? That's the question you'd like to know, because there must be circuits that determine th such things as laying down a memory and retrieving it or, or processing information. I was in my office uh, a week ago and somebody walked down the hall speaking to someone else. And it's somebody I had not actually seen in five years, and it was not somebody I expected uh, was going to be at NIH that day, and I immediately knew who it was. Uh, now, how is it that the brain can process that kind of very subtle information and make that connection? That's pretty amazing. And a lot of other amazing things, of course, uh, that are possible. So we would like to mount an effort, and again, this should be an international effort, uh, to understand the language of the brain. How do these circuits work? We pulled together a remarkable team uh, of visionary neuroscientists, about 15 of them, who've been working furiously uh, over the last year to define exactly what the goals for this project ought to be. Build a census of cell types. We don't actually know all the different cells in the brain. Figure out how the ma uh, brain is structured. Build the structural maps. Uh, develop abilities to record not just a few neurons at a time, or not even a few thousand, but maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of neurons at a time. Uh, develop a suite of tools where you don't just record, but you manipulate. Obviously, this is mostly in experimental animals. Link that to behavior. Integrate with computation, theory, modeling, and statistics uh, to begin to build an in silico understanding of how the brain works. Uh, do a better job of understanding how imaging uh, works and apply it more broadly figure out how you could collect human data, as for instance, when individuals are in the operating room having epilepsy surgery, where there is often an opportunity with full consent uh, to do some determination of circuit function. And of course, we need to train and disseminate. That's going to be the bold outline. Actually, last night, uh, as I was uh, looking at my computer in, in the hotel, 
the final report of this group came through. It will be released on June 5th. It includes not just these general outlines, but very specific milestones and timetables over a 10-year period. Uh, so this is going to be very interesting to see how people react to it. I must say, it is a truly visionary document, and uh, I was quite impressed with what this group has done. I think they must have put the rest of their life on hold for the last year in order to achieve this. Well, this was a lot about basic science, but you can see already it's blurred a bit uh, into translation. We wouldn't be doing the brain initiative if we didn't think it was going to help us understand autism and epilepsy and schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease and traumatic brain injury and all down that list. But we do need to build that basic foundation uh, to have a better chance at that. So these are not themes that have bright lines between them. But certainly we want to have a specific intention uh, not to leave untouched uh, those translational opportunities when they emerge, but to nurture those to go f as fast as possible. So c let's come back to this diagram. This was the good news. Discovery has happened. How many of these 5,000 diseases, though, actually have currently approved treatments? This is the bad news, about 250. We have a huge challenge and a responsibility here to try to take what we know and turn it into things that we can do. And again, many of these are rare disorders, but if it's your family and if it's your child, you're not that interested in somebody telling you that it's rare. And therefore, it doesn't matter so much. It matters an awful lot. And again, what we learn about rare diseases often has broad implications. Now, once in a while, the discovery of the genetic risk, the defect, leads you to an idea about treatment that you would never have had otherwise. I mentioned those kids uh, with DADA2 who are now in a clinical trial uh, with plasmapheresis. Sometimes it's even better than that. This is a little girl, uh, Kayla who was brought to NIH shortly after birth with a rash and a fever. At this point in this picture, uh, she's about nine months old. Uh, constant rashes, fevers, uh, joint pains of what appears to be meningitis, but there is no organism identified. Uh, her whole inflammatory system is just constantly in the on position. And this is a disease called neonatal onset multisystem inflammatory disease, a NOMID. Well, genetics has provided an answer here. She has a mutation in a gene which activates her inflammatory system, so it is always stuck in the on position. The system assumes that there's an invading a pathogen of some sort, and it's trying to fight it off, except there's no invading pathogen. But because you know that, and you know the pathway involved, you can then look and say, okay, have any drugs been developed that deal with inflammation that might be just right for this? And it turns out there's a drug called anakinra, which was developed not for this disease, because it's extremely rare, but for rheumatoid arthritis was approved for rheumatoid arthritis back in 2001. It actually blocks the receptor for interleukin-1, which is one of the major players in the inflammatory response. So Kayla and a bunch of other kids with this disease were tried on that, and the response was really dramatic. Uh, within a week, fevers were gone, rash was fading, pain was uh, lessening. And now I'm glad to show you a picture of Kayla, who's uh, 10 years old, going to regular school, doing actually quite beautifully well. She'll need to be on this drug for life, uh, but the drug seems to have relatively few side effects. You might worry that she's a little bit vulnerable to infection by having uh, her inflammatory system uh, closed down a bit. But so far, uh, she's handled childhood illnesses. She's in regular school. She seems to be doing great. So that's wonderful when it happens. And there's a story here about repurposing a drug that was developed for one thing and then figuring out it works for another uh, that we're seeing happen more and more and we should be encouraging to happen. Because, of course, if you have a drug that's already gone through all of the approval process, uh, getting it actually to work for a new disease is quick. If you have to start from scratch and develop a drug without any idea what that drug's going to be, you're talking about a decade and a hundred million dollars or more. So constant attention here to this repurposing idea. One of the things we've done to try to encourage this sort of thinking about how to accelerate the process of developing therapies uh, for those thousands of diseases that are still waiting uh, is to form a new center at NIH, NCATS, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. You can see the mission here. Uh, NCATS is a bold enterprise trying to identify what are the bottlenecks that take, means that it takes so long uh, to get from a hoped-for answer to something that's actually been proven to work. I'll give you just one example of something NCATS is doing, which is very high-tech, but actually has a lot of promise. 
One of the things that holds up the process of getting to a successful treatment is figuring out whether your new drug that you've just developed based on an animal model or maybe just on a cell model is actually safe enough to give to a human because you don't want to take the risk in that first phase one trial of making somebody really sick if you can avoid it. So right now, the regulatory agencies will require you uh, to test your drug at escalating doses in some small animals and some large animals and look to see if anything bad happens. It's very slow. It's expensive. Uh, it is low throughput, and it's not very accurate. Wouldn't it be nice if you had a way to test toxicity in human cells without putting humans at risk, but to do so in a way that was pretty close to what happens in vivo? Well, here's where we can build upon the amazing advances in stem cell biology uh, to try to develop a biochip that would do just that. Uh, take a skin biopsy from any of us, add those famous four genes uh, that Yamanaka identified, convince those uh, fibroblasts uh, to become induced pluripotent stem cells. That's very straightforward now. Uh, then differentiate those cells into whatever tissues you think are going to be most important for testing toxicity. So that would certainly be liver and heart and lung, maybe kidney, maybe muscle, maybe neurons. Then take those cells, once they've been differentiated, 3D print them into a three-dimensional organoid, which is also something one can do now. So they're looking more and more like little chunks of tissue, except they started out as a skin biopsy. And then wire them up with appropriate readouts that will tell you whether the cells are happy or not in any given circumstance, looking, for instance, at gene expression. Then you've got a biochip. And then you can take that biochip and train it with compounds that you know have been safe in humans, so you know what that signature looked like, and then train it with compounds that haven't been safe in humans uh, to see what those signatures look like. And then you've got an algorithm uh, to try out something that where you don't know the answer. That's our goal here, and we're doing this jointly with the FDA and with DARPA, the Department of Defense's uh, engineering uh, skilled set of folks, the people who brought you things like the internet and GPS, and they have a little experience here in this space. So this is a bold effort. It's a five-year project. We're only about two years into it uh, right now. I'd say we're well ahead of where we thought we were going to be. Um, uh, we have things like a kidney on a chip and a lung on a chip that are looking actually like pretty good representations of what happens in vivo. I have to, as I'm talking about technology, though, uh, bring to your attention something you've probably heard a lot about because we're here in Brazil. Uh, and that is this whole business of figuring out how to make brain-machine interfaces uh, or brain interfaces uh, with all kinds of uh, important contraptions for individuals who have suffered brain injuries or spinal cord injuries. Paralysis affects 6 million in the U.S., many more worldwide. On June 12th, uh, the world, maybe 3, 3 billion people, uh, will be gathered uh, to see the opening ceremonies of the World Cup here in Brazil but they will also have exposure to some really remarkable science. I was privileged yesterday uh, here in Sao Paulo uh, to spend an hour and a half with Miguel Nicolelis, whose picture you see down there in the lower left, who is a Duke investigator, but he's a Brazilian, and whose research on building this exoskeleton that would allow a paraplegic to be able to walk and even to kick uh, a football uh, is a remarkable achievement. Uh, this is jointly supported by U.S. and Brazil. Uh, I watched uh, yesterday uh, two of the individuals who have complete spinal cord paralysis who are being trained for this, and I guess he's not yet decided which one will be chosen for that moment on June the 12th where the world is watching. But the technology is truly amazing. Uh, it's been possible to achieve. Now, how does it work? It works by a, a cap that is placed on uh, the individual's head, which is detecting their brain waves. It's like an EEG. And that is then connected to a computer, which is in a backpack, and through a whole series of hydraulic connections, that then operates uh, the lower limbs. And it is necessary then for the individual, by thinking about walking, to activate the system to result in just that. And imagine 
would you have imagined that would work? I'm not sure too many people would have. It's teaching us amazing things about the plasticity of the brain, the ability of the brain to relearn a task when given the opportunity. The other thing Miguel told me is that the important part of this that he hadn't quite expected is that the foot pads are actually outfitted with sensors that detect whether or not you have touched the ground. And that information is fed back to vibrators on the forearms of the individual, and they have full sensation there. And the trainees tell you that after a couple of weeks of this, their brains begin to interpret that just as if they were actually feeling their foot touch the ground. And they don't have to think about, oh, that was a buzz, that means the foot had touched. It becomes automatic. Imagine how that works. It's uh, just phenomenal. So yes, everyone's holding their breath a little bit here. June 12th is not too far away. Uh, but I must say, what I saw yesterday uh, impressed me greatly. And again, I hope when people see this, they won't think that was something developed overnight. This is 20 years of hard, hard work that many people might have said, oh, that'll never work. This is the kind of thing that the public, I think, also needs to understand, that medical research is not a 100-yard dash. It's a marathon. Well, I want to mention a couple of other things in terms of uh, really exciting breakthroughs that, that have happened. Uh, that are relevant uh, to this translational science uh, area. Science Magazine every year publishes its breakthrough of the year. And uh, actually, they have a list of 10, but they always pick uh, a first choice and put it on the cover. And cancer immunotherapy uh, was it last year. And that's really interesting, because we've been working on cancer immunotherapy for more than 20 years. And most of the time, it's been pretty frustrating. But boy, things have happened in the last year or two that are really quite amazing. Uh, it is clear that the immune system has always been one of our protections against cancer, but somehow, and when a cancer really gets going, uh, it figures out how to evade the immune system's uh, ability uh, to search and destroy those cancer cells. So how could we unleash that? Because uh, cancer cells apparently are able to block the protein receptors that hinder the immune response, uh, such things as CTLA-4 and PD-1. Could you, in fact, develop uh, a way of opening them up again? Well, yes. Uh, that has, in fact, been applied now quite successfully uh, in a number of cancers. Or even more bold, can you program T cells to go after a particular cell surface marker of that person's tumor and activate them to do so, so-called chimeric antigen receptors? Again, very exciting science that's going on, bringing together what we know about cancer with what we know about immunology. The other nine of the science breakthroughs of the year were also uh, nice to see because Goodness, uh, out of the 10, eight of them are in biomedical research. So we must be in the right field, people. This is a really exciting time to see how the, all of these developments are happening. And each one of these is worth uh, thinking about or talking about. I'll just mention one other one, which is also in the field of immunology, which is very promising in terms of its public health implications. And that is new insights about vaccines. When you bring together the, what you know about immunology, what you can do with genomics, and what you can learn about structural biology, in particular, the advances that are happening right now with influenza are putting us on a path, <clears throat> perhaps in seven or eight years, to have not a vaccine for influenza that has to be re-engineered every year, which is the current situation, but one that would work for all influenzas, including the next pandemic for which we are overdue. So how would you do this? The problem with the way in which our current vaccines work and the way that native immunity works is that the hemagglutinin molecule, uh, which you see here, uh, has uh, a part of it, which is particularly variable, the head, which is where most antibodies are raised. And yet there's a stem down there <clears throat> that doesn't change very much, but is a bit hidden from the immune system. Here's just showing you an example. Each one of those yellow uh, butt balls there is an amino acid that's different between these three influenza strains. And if you looked at many influenza strains, you would see the, the areas that change are in the head. And that's why immunity doesn't carry over uh, very well. But look at the stem. Not much happening there in terms of variation, because if it did, the stem would fall apart. Well, we have now figured out that there are rare individuals who make antibodies to the stem. Could we teach all of our immune systems how to do that? Probably we could, by an elegant scheme of figuring out what the right vaccine would look like to draw the immune system's attention uh, to this part of the protein that normally gets ignored. And this is already in phase one trials, and we have collaborations here in Brazil on vaccine development, including some of the ones I saw yesterday at Butantan uh, that are a very important part of this. Well, we also need to think about how when medical care has developed a certain approach, but we're not quite sure whether it's right 
or in many instances where there's multiple approaches to a problem, how do we figure out well, which of those is working best? This is sort of healthcare uh, science research uh, in, the, uh, in the real world. An example of that is the ischemia trial, which is underway now uh, here across the world, and obviously a very important one because of the uh, significance of this disorder. So there are now 400 sites, 24 of them here in Brazil, that are conducting this trial to try to understand what is the right way uh, to intervene with somebody who's just been diagnosed uh, with ischemic heart disease. Here are the principal investigators uh, in, in Brazil. Uh, here are, uh, the, here's the idea. There could be, in some instances, a conservative approach, and that's what many physicians would now do. Okay, you have first diagnosis of ischemic heart disease, start medical therapy. Many times that works. But others will say, no, you need a cardiac cath, uh, you probably need a stent or a bypass. Okay, that's pretty invasive in some instances. Uh, is that justified? Well, let's find out. Uh, let's do the classic randomized controlled trial. That's what ischemia is all about. 8,000 patients, 1,000 of them with chronic kidney disease uh, getting enrolled right now, and we're going to find out the answer to this, and Brazil is a big part of this effort. I guess I've already been talking about global health, so it seems kind of silly just to get to it now because many of the things uh, that I've mentioned only make sense on a global scale, from the Human Genome Project uh, to this very clinical trial I just talked about. But certainly, a couple other things might be mentioned in that regard. Antimicrobial resistance, a growing global uh, problem, and a local one for all of us. At our clinical center at NIH, uh, we went through a very scary situation uh, about a year and a half ago with an outbreak of a highly resistant Klebsiella strain uh, that was wreaking havoc in our ICU, in our research hospital. Ultimately, 20 people infected with this bug, which is resistant to all known antibiotics. Ultimately, we were able to stop the outbreak uh, by a very uh, detailed and high-tech genomic approach uh, to track down exactly how the spread was occurring and put an end to it. Uh, and we're going to need to do more and more of that. But obviously, we have a serious issue here in terms of a limited number of new antibiotics being produced and bacteria getting increasingly clever about how to become resistant to virtually everything we have in the medicine cabinet. I can point out a specific example here from Sao Paulo, just published in the New England Journal uh, about a month ago, uh, where an individual uh, was diagnosed uh, with a MRSA, a methicillin-resistant Staph aureus uh, strain uh, in the bloodstream. And then over the course of time, after treatment, with vancomycin developed resistance to that too by the acquisition of a plasmid. This article, very nicely done, uh, basically details uh, what the nature of that plasmid was, and it's pretty scary when you think about this kind of thing happening. MRSA is bad enough, uh, but now vancomycin-resistant MRSA really leaves us in a vulnerable place. Uh, so much credit uh, to those here in Sao Paulo uh, who played a significant role in identifying this, not just as a vexing medical problem, but as an opportunity to learn something important. But I do want to uh, announce a new program uh, today that fits into this space of antimicrobial resistance, although in this case I'm not talking bacteria, I'm actually going to talk about fungi. We have a serious problem about fungal infections. We have a limited number of agents that work against them. And there is a new project that uh, is going to be co-sponsored by NIH. Uh, and uh, FAPSP, which is uh, a very exciting one, and one that you could hardly imagine if you didn't know the background. So consider Brazilian ants in the Amazon that for 50 or 60 million years have been making ba uh, do by basically running farms. And what do they farm? They farm fungi. A remarkable sort of uh, synergistic relationship here. But their farms don't always do well because there are other invasive fungi which, if they were able to take over, uh, would ruin uh, their food supply and ruin the ants' uh, survival. So the ants have evolved a truly unique strategy, and this is breathtaking when you see what this is. They have, and here's a picture of one of the ants, uh, developed exocrine gl glands uh, in the exoskeleton. So what you see there, the white uh, bubbly looking things, those are bacteria that are happily living uh, in these uh, uh, particular crevices in the exoskeleton of this ant species that are designed exactly for them. 
the bacteria or a strain called Pseudonocardia. So what do the bacteria do? They produce antifungal agents that actually are not toxic to the fungi that the ants like to eat, but are very toxic to the invasive ones. Um, we have no idea how that works. But you can imagine uh, there must be some pretty interesting natural products uh, in this particular uh, interaction. And so uh, this research project, which was reviewed at NIH and got almost a perfect score, uh, and is co-led uh, by John Clardy at Harvard and Monica Tallarico Pupo at USP, and this also was very positively and enthusiastically reviewed uh, here, uh, is now about to get started as part of the International Cooperative Biodiversity Groups Program. The obvious immediate application would be antifungal agents, uh, but these investigators believe that we may discover a whole host of other natural products that might have other applications, including cancer and leishmaniasis. So this is a great example of how to bring together uh, scientists from different perspectives. We're particularly thrilled, uh, by the way, that the way in which this project is funded, NIH supports its part, FOPSB supports it part, its part, uh, and we don't have bureaucracy, <laughs> which is always a good thing. We can actually get this started right away. Uh, we'd love to see more of that. Uh, we're going to be talking with the leadership here about the ways in which we might come up with other projects of this sort. Anyway, I'm quite excited about this. Is this not a wild idea? But it's just the kind of thing that you could imagine would come out of the detailed analysis uh, that goes on in, in a place like Brazil, uh, putting that together with some other ideas from other disciplines, and uh, who knows, uh, maybe coming up with a really significant medical advance. This won't happen overnight, of course. We've got a road to travel, but the road can get started. Well, finally, the last slide I want to talk about is reinvigorating the biomedical research community. This is a critical part of our future. In the NIH, we think about this a lot. We are under stress right now. We've lost more than 20 percent of our purchasing power for research over the last 10 years, and that was particularly uh, painfully documented with the sequester that happened last year. But we are guardedly optimistic we're starting to turn that corner, and that is the thing which I think is going to be most important in the long run, is to be sure that we are nurturing and encouraging the creativity of scientists who are just getting started uh, to be able to ask those important questions. And in that regard, we are delighted for the opportunity to work with Brazil in those kinds of training opportunities. The uh, CNPQ Visiting Fellows Program, which is, of course, something that's been possible uh, for Brazilian uh, graduate students and postdocs to take advantage of in multiple institutions around the world, also has an arm in our intramural program at NIH. 17,000 scientists work there, and we already have about 80 postdocs uh, from Brazil. But we'd be delighted to see more of that. This is part of the Science Without Borders initiative. Uh, the in support from CNPQ includes a half of a stipend for two years, NIH covers the other half, and uh, travel costs back to Brazil. And all that's required is to find an investigator at NIH who's interested in being the sponsor and being willing to cover the other half and to design a project that everybody uh, agrees is an exciting one. Uh, so we are looking forward uh, to increasing uh, that remarkable opportunity uh, to work with talented scientists from Brazil uh, in order to chase after all of these exciting uh, scientific opportunities. Uh, if you want to know more about this, there's the website. You may have already been to it a few times, but uh, if you travel around in it, you'll find uh, various descriptions of some of these programs, including the one at NIH. So I hope this has given you a bit of a sense of some of the things that make it pretty exciting to be involved in biomedical research. Uh, when I wake up in the morning, I never know what's going to be the new discovery uh, that suddenly pops up in my email or on the website, because uh, things are happening very fast. Uh, it is a wonderful time, a privilege, uh, to be able to take part in this grand endeavor. I don't know where it's going. People often say, well, you know, what's the future of medicine? Even my talk was supposed to have something about the future. I don't know what the future really looks like, but I hope that we can agree together. It's going to be awesome, and our goal should be to enable it uh, to get to that remarkable place where we have understood answers to the mysteries of life that have vexed humanity for all time, and we've come up with answers for those thousands of diseases uh, where people are anxiously waiting with hopes that we will find an answer for them. Together, I'm sure we can do that, and I'm delighted to be here in Brazil to share that vision with all of you. Thank you very much.
pessoas que estão na outra sala vão mandar por escrito. Well, thank you, Dr. Dr. Collins, for a great talk, stimulating, enlightening. And we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. Let's see here. Professor Isia was the first one to raise her hand. Thank you very much for a very inspiring talk. Uh, my name is Isia Lopez Sendes. I'm a physician geneticist uh, working in the field of neurogenetics uh, at the University of Campinas. And I'd like to know your opinion, both as a scientist and as a director of a very important uh, research funding agency, of whether you think there is still place or there is still good science in doing a project such as the 1,000 genomes plus ENCODE in a sample of the Brazilian population. And I would like your opinion in terms of what this could benefit the scientific and uh, health uh, care professionals in Brazil, as well as if you, if you think there is still good science that could come out of this. Yes. In other words, if you had to advise Professor Brito whether <laughs> FAPESP should support an initiative like that, what you'd say to him? Thank you, thank you, Isia. This is a very subtle question. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> I, I think she wants me to spend your money, so I <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> As long as I can spend yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a question that many uh, countries and funding agencies are trying to address. What is the sort of next step here? Uh, I think we already have a pretty good sense of the variations across the genome that are, are present in most populations. And South America is not particularly well represented, but it is represented to some degree. Um, so I'm not sure that I would advocate for a program like the 1,000 Genomes, which was solely focused on DNA without any phenotype information. Instead, uh, the time has really come, I think, uh, to contemplate uh, a more disease-oriented effort. Uh, in the UK, for instance, uh, they are now going for 100,000 genomes, but they will do them on individuals with complete access to medical records so they can begin to figure out what the connections are. Uh, certainly in the US, uh, we are talking about such things as relates to a new uh, patient-centered outcomes research network, uh, which may provide such access. Uh, and other countries, uh, even Middle East and China and Japan, are talking about the same things. So I think it is a useful project to begin to contemplate, but one needs to think carefully about how would you choose the individuals? Some of these are intended to be sort of cross-sections across, but of course then you're not enriching for any particular disorder uh, to the point where you're likely to have enough power uh, to learn about that, because you're going to be looking for DNA changes that are associated with some kind of phenotype. And because we all have DNA variants of unknown significance, it's hard to get an answer unless you have enough individuals with a particular condition. So it might make more sense uh, to think about a target uh, of a disease area uh, where you could imagine such a sequence-oriented effort could make a contribution. My own lab right now involved in this for type 2 diabetes. We've gone beyond the sort of SNP chip approach to doing deep sequencing as part of a collaborative effort. And it's interesting and still pretty tough to sort through, even with a thousand genomes on people who have pretty well characterized diabetes. It's, it's still uh, and computationally uh, a struggle, not to be uh, underestimated. But I would say, yeah, think about what would be a, a really Brazilian uh, high priority uh, for a target, and then maybe design along those lines if you can get the funding for it. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Collins. Another question here. Hi, uh, I'm Julia. I'm actually a PhD fellow from FAPESP at uh, the School of Medicine of Ribeirão Preto. 
from the University of Sao Paulo, and I actually work with cancer. And you uh, comment a little bit of the Cancer Genome Atlas, and I would like to know if you could briefly comment uh, how are the improve in the translation of this information, Cancer Atlas, uh, for rare cancers and for cancers that are rarely distributed. Like there are some, uh, I know that in the south of Brazil, are uh, different cancers that are more frequently. Yeah. And you comment that on the Cancer Atlas, there are just six countries that you're um, including. And I would like to know uh, about these rare cancers and if you are considering you're including samples and mm -hmm. a little bit, how is the translation of information? Thank you. No, it's a good question. The initial TCGA was focused on the common cancers uh, in part because you need hundreds of samples uh, for each cancer type and it's sometimes hard to find those for the rare ones. There is an effort for pediatric cancers, most of which are fairly rare, uh, which is going on right now as a collaboration between St. Jude's Hospital and the uh, University in St. Louis, Washington University, which is beginning to tell some tales about that. But of course, there's many other rare cancers for which samples have just not been forthcoming. I would say any country uh, that has access uh, in a unique way uh, to cancer samples from a, a rare disorder that happens to be slightly more frequent in that space, uh, this is a great opportunity uh, to try to contribute to this overall effort. Um, and just because Brazil at the moment is focused on melanoma, I wouldn't say that's a reason not to think about uh, taking on some potential other cancer targets as well. I don't know, because I don't know enough about epidemiology in Brazil, what cancers those would be, but it certainly deserves investigation, especially as the cost is coming down so fast. Thank you, Professor Collins. Professor Mayana Zatz. Thank first, congratulations for a fantastic talk. Uh, I was in Cancun in 2003 when you announced the ending of the, the Human Genome Project. I remember you said, we did it, we did it. It, <laughs> it was wonderful. Uh, I um, am a molecular biologist and I direct one of the centers that is supported by FAPESP where we work with human genome and stem cell with in genetic disorders. But uh, one of my question that I would like to come, that I would like to hear your comment is about incidental findings that which time are more common with the next generation sequencing. So what is your opinion about, what is our responsibilities, what should we inform to, to patients? That's a great question and a vexing one that doesn't have a consensus answer yet. Uh, the question relates to incidental findings in genome sequencing because anybody's DNA that you analyze is going to turn up uh, with some things uh, that look like they might be significant, but you're not sure. Uh, and some of them, uh, there will be no way to really know because you are a new mutation for those. We're all, by the way, carrying around 60 to 100 new mutations uh, that <laughs> happened in the sperm or the egg involved in our uh, coming into being. So there's no sort of database you can go to to look and see what those mean. <laughs> they happened in you. <laughs> Maybe somebody else on the planet had the same thing by accident, but it's gonna be very hard to draw conclusions. But more significantly than that, uh, when you survey across the protein coding regions, which is the part we think we know the most about, for almost anybody's genome, even a totally healthy person that you look at, you're gonna find a couple, three, four, variants that cause you some concern, including like stop codons and frame shifts, and things that don't look benign, but apparently are tolerated because they're present in most people. And it's a very tough question to know what's your obligation when you find those things to feed that information back to the person. Are you giving them information that they wish not to have? <laughs> or are you being fully transparent and disclosing you know, what's there? I think for researchers, the answer to this is to be sure when you embark in this kind of a program that this is part of your consent process, that you basically make uh, an agreement uh, with your research participant about what they want to know and what they don't. Uh, it is harder when this gets into clinical practice and somebody has a complete genome analysis because you know of a strong family history of cancer and what do you know? Uh, you turn up with something else that you didn't expect that says, 
well, you also might get Parkinson's disease. Are, are, you, are you obligated to tell them that? And the American College of Medical Genetics got out there and made a recommendation that there were some 56 actionable mutations that you should reveal. And that caused a lot of people to get pretty stirred up uh, about whether that, in fact, was the right answer or not. So it's a great question. I think in research, it really means we got to be thoughtful about making a bargain uh, with our research participants about how we're going to handle this ahead of time, not after the fact. In clinical practice, it's not resolved yet, and we have to get a little further down that road. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Another one there. Hi, my name is Enrique. I'm from the University of Campinas, and I'm a young researcher from uh, FAPESPI. And I have a general question. You said about the brain initiative. And I know that, for example, uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute has the Janelia Farm, yes. that is a brain initiative institute or, or, or research center. Uh, how how does that how does that work with like between NIH and Howard Hughes because it's like a, a worldwide initiative that probably Howard Hughes is making the same thing so is there a crosstalk and yes. how efficient is like between funding agencies in the same country to work? That's a great question. Uh, we are working very closely with HHMI. Uh, Jerry Rubin is part of this brainstorming uh, group that I mentioned that's developed this 10-year plan. Janelia Farms is particularly focused on Drosophila uh, as a model uh, of the nervous system. And we are delighted about that and hope that they will continue to push that forward. The Allen Institute for Brain Science in Seattle also has been a big part of our planning process because they've already spent $60 million developing really remarkable insights into both the mouse and the human brain anatomy and gene expression. The European Union uh, has a human brain project uh, which is just getting underway on which they expect to spend about 2 billion euros. And its goal is really to build an in silico model of the human brain. That's actually quite nicely synergistic uh, with what we hope to do in the United States, which is more experimental data collection. And then they can use that to feed their model development. And there's interest in China, and there's interest in Israel. I think there's going to be uh, a groundswell of interest in lots of countries. And that's great. Uh, it, will, it, will, it will require some coordination so that we don't all stumble over each other. But I think we're off to a pretty good start, and it's still very early in this process. Uh, there's plenty of room uh, for great ideas and uh, smart people to join in. We have time for one last question yes. here. My name is Pesquero. I work at University, Federal University of Sao Paulo, mainly in the medicine area. I'd like to change more or less the discussion we are using this genetic information, a lot of genetic information, for, to treat patients and to study, of course, loss of function in our genome. I would like to ask you about the other side of the question. Gain of function. When we see uh, changes in our genome that give us any advantage, how do you see this, to use this kind of information in the future? Well, it's a great... Part of uh, what we would love to do more of is to understand not just what are losses, uh, but what are things that add to human health, the other side of that coin. Uh, one way to look at this, of course, is to study people who are unusually healthy. Uh, our Institute on Aging is now engaged in studying people who have reached the age of 100 who have relatively little in the way of chronic diseases and trying to say, OK, what gains have they somehow managed in their genomes uh, to be able uh, to sustain things that way. And there are a couple of things emerging. Uh, my own, the other project in my own lab, not to be too personal about it, but it's relevant here, is studying this extremely rare disease called progeria, the most dramatic form of premature aging. And we figured out that the mutation in that disease is a mutation in the gene for a protein called lamin A. So, Okay, that means that you create a toxic version of that protein and it makes your cells senesce prematurely. But if lamin A is involved in dramatic premature aging, could there be another side to that? So we've studied hundreds of individuals who made it to age 100, compared them to a randomly selected group of people uh, who otherwise are well matched, and sure enough, there seems to be a haplotype, that is, a particular version of lamin A and its regulatory sequences that's overrepresented in the people who made it to 100 years old. So there's something they've got going for them. It is this gain of function, I suppose, although it's been around a long time. This is not one of those things that has a new mutation like we were talking about a minute ago. Um, will we be able, if we really get smart about the genome, to do that a bit more systematically? Uh, you have to figure out who are the people you want to study. 
which of us could claim we're healthier than the rest uh, might not be true tomorrow when we get a diagnosis we don't want. Uh, at the moment, we're kind of focusing on people who made it uh, through a lot of decades, but there may be better ways to do this. I totally agree with you, though. We, in research, have tended to be disease researchers, not health researchers. Uh, we, we could do more of that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Well, I want to thank everybody for attending and invite you to once again thank Dr. Collins for a great presentation and discussion here at FAPESP. Thank you, Dr. Collins. <laughs>